Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is on the two small books in the Old Testament, Ezra and Nehemiah. They were partners, as you remember. And this is lesson number 10 in that series for December 7 of 2019, entitled Worshiping the Lord. And we're going to see several interesting aspects of that question in this lesson. Hope you'll enjoy it as we have. But we always like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have gathered around this table this evening to talk about you and about how you interacted with these people so many, many years ago. We wish we could have been there to see all the events that took place and then have some idea about how we might have been involved. But we know someday we'll be able to see that all in 3D living color and we look forward to that day. Now as we discuss it, help us to dis discuss it in a way that would be meaningful not only to us but to all those who are listening in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have been working our way through these two books, and we've discussed a number of events that uh, really laid up to what we're going to talk about today. We learned that under the guidance of Ezra and Nehemiah, the temple services were reestablished. Uh, the wall around Jerusalem was completed. That led to the tremendous rejoicing and celebration. Now, when we say the temple services were reestablished, we don't mean the temple was rebuilt. That happened about 60, 70 years earlier. But they were sort of haphazard before that because there was no wall of safety around the city. There was just openings and their enemies came and went and the enemies had were using portions of the, of the temple for pagan purposes. But now they're going to clean up the act. They're going to get everything fixed up and do it right. And the people felt like that was enough reason for rejoicing and celebrating. Well, as we know, Ezra and his group returned to Jerusalem in that fateful year of 457 B.C. with a much smaller group, but with the protection and authority of the Persian emperor, Nehemiah returned about 13 la years later in 444 B.C. After a brief time of gathering the necessary information and preparing himself, Nehemiah announced that they were going to finish rebuilding the wall around the city of Jerusalem. The people threw themselves into the work with such vigor and enthusiasm that the wall was completed in only 52 days. It was completed in the month of Elul, um, the sixth month in the Jewish religious year. The next month, the seventh month, was the normal time for the Feast of Tabernacles, the Day of Atonement, and then the Fe I'm sorry, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. All three of those pro very important events took place in one month. So try to imagine yourself with the people and how they felt with the wall complete, the temple act sort of cleaned up. It might have taken a few days for them. To, I don't, who, who? Probably some of the ladies were responsible. Jackie, don't you think the ladies would have been responsible for organizing the celebrations? Absolutely. Seems like that's what happened at our house. <laughs> the people are responsible for the celebrations are the ladies. But they had to organize themselves a little bit, and so we read about what happened next in Nehemiah 12. And Carrie, I think you have something about that. Yes, I'm going to read verses 27 through 29. The city wall of Jerusalem was dedicated. The Levites were brought in from wherever they were living so that they could join in the celebrating this dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals and harps. The Levite families of singers gathered from the area where they had settled around Jerusalem and from the towns round Nidapha and Beth Gilgal, Jeba and Asmaveth. That comes from American Bible Society and the Good News Translation. Okay, so after that we read what happened next. I assembled the leaders of Judah on top of the wall and put them in charge of two large groups to march around the city giving thanks to God. Now, you know, I don't know how you looked at this, but when you said there was a wall, what, what came up in your mind when someone says, we, we finished the wall? I wondered immediately how they finished all that big rock work, what they had to use. Wow, amazing. And now this wall is wide enough so the people, some people sometimes built their houses in those walls. 
and it's wide enough so that there were two large groups of people that marched around the city and I wonder what happens when they came to a gate were these gates covered somehow or other so they marched right over the gate probably and then it was and then there was a wooden door that moved back and forth somehow around or underneath I don't know exactly uh, someday we'll maybe see it in vision or whatever but they marched around that city the first group went to the right on top of the wall towards the rubbish gate Hoshiah marched behind the singers followed by half the leaders of Judah the following priests uh, I guess I can read their names blowing trumpets marched next Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah Benjamin, Shemaiah and Jeremiah next came Zechariah the son of Jonathan and grandson of Shemaiah his ancestors also included Mataniah, Micaiah and Zachar of the, clan, of the clan of Asaph he was followed by other members of his clan Shemaiah, Azarel. Melali, Gilali, Mai, Nethanel, Judah, and Hananiah, all of whom carried musical instruments of the kind played by King David, the man of God. Ezra the scholar led this group in the possession. At the fountain gate, they went up the steps that led to David's city, past David's palace, and back to the wall at the water gate on the east side of the city. The other group of those who gave thanks went to the left along the top of the wall, and I followed with half of the people. We marched past the town, Tower of the Ovens, to the Broad Wall. And from there, we went past Ephraim Gate and Jeshana Gate, the Fish Gate, the Tower of Hananel, and the Tower of the Hundred, to the Sheep Gate. We ended our march near the gate to the temple. So both the groups that were giving thanks to God reached the temple area. In addition to the leaders who were with me, my group included the following priests blowing trumpets, Eliakim, Maaseah, Miniamen, Micaiah, Elioid Nai, Zechariah and Hananiah, and they were followed by Maaseh, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzi, Jehohanan, Malchijah, Elam, and Ezer. And you Jews who are listening in will have to excuse me for pronunciation of those names. The singers, led by Jezrahiah, sang to the top of their voices. Wow. Couple of questions. Yeah. Approximately how long was this? It was about three miles around the city. And is this the time when they had a shield in their hand and uh, no, so on, so? probably not. Probably this was no. celebration. The wall, the wall was finished now. Right, yeah, but is this the time when they really, really were looking out for the enemies to come and might attack any well, time? We already passed a verse that said the wall is finished, and even their enemies recognized that the only way it got, it got done like that so quickly was by the power of God. So I don't think they were even trying to attack them right at this point in time. But they were ready. But what I'm, pro- they were ready. what I'm yeah, saying well, is well, they were ready, yeah. approximately how many people were involved. I mean, that wide a wall? Yeah, exactly. Fairly high. Hundreds, hundreds of people involved. Right, and it's stones, stones, no mortar involved. So what involved. we're talking about is parades, both right. way around the city to meet on the other end. Wow. Yeah. They had something to celebrate. Yes. Very happy. Well, the kind of walls they built in those days were different from the kind of walls we might be thinking about in our day. The wall was so massive that whole groups of people can march around the city on top of the wall. There are places for watchmen to hide and for people to protect themselves behind outposts. Uh, so on, on the wall, while, they're fought, while they fought against any enemy who, enemy who might be approaching. So in their celebration, one group, or approximately half of the people who were involved, marched with Ezra in one direction around the city on top of the wall, while Nehemiah went with the other group the other way around the city on the top of the wall. They met at a place near the temple itself and then proceeded into the temple area. Priests blew the trumpets when they reached the courtyard of the temple. The two groups stood facing each other (coughs) and celebrated with music. Can you imagine? Since the days of David and Asaph, his temple musician, it was expected that dedicated musicians, not only singers, but also players of instruments would accompany the worship services at the temple. How were those worship temple services conducted? Have you ever asked yourself of this? How many people were allowed to go into the most holy place? One. One person, the high priest. How many people were allowed to go into the holy place? A few. A few, the priests. So where do they meet for these big celebrations? It would have to be in the courtyard. And that courtyard was designated to be the place for Gentiles to come and watch the Jewish ceremonies and hopefully be impressed that they wanted to join. 
Was this even inside the wall where the, the laver was and other things like that? The no. Basin? This is outside of that. It has to be outside of that wall. Yeah. yeah. Because inside of that wall, only priests were allowed to go. Yeah. And in the in, in Herod's temple, now I don't know about Solomon's temple, but well, this is halfway in between. So Herod's temple had not yet been built and Solomon's temple was gone. But in, in Herod's temple, there was another area around that with a small wall around that said only Jewish men are allowed to go in here. Another one, only, well, all Jews were allowed to go in there. And then there's another wall that said only Jewish men are able, able to go beyond that. And then priests and then the high priest. So there were walls, 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 walls. All the way out. So I don't know. That's a question you can solve for yourself out there. If you have an answer, please email it to us. Well, we know that there were no public services conducted inside the temple in the holy place or the most holy place. Well, more than 500 years after the days of David and Asaph and under the careful guidance of Nehemiah and Ezra, people are hoping to reestablish a correct worship of God. And that's the point of what we're, we're coming to. So what information do we have about the musicians in David's day? Speaking about Asaph, it says, Jackie? First Chronicles 25, 6-8 All of his sons played cymbals and harps under their father's direction to accompany the temple worship. And Asaph, Jeduthun, Haman were under orders from the king. All these 24 men were experts and their fellow Levites were trained musicians. There were 288 men in all. To determine the assignment of duties, they all drew lots whether they were young or old, experts or beginners. Good wow. Bible. There you go. So this was quite a quite a, uh, an event, quite, I mean, a, quite a, a whole group of them that, that provided them the music. And once again, I asked the question, this is obviously not inside the temple. This must be in the courtyard, outside, where they did this, these musical numbers, whatever they were. By the way, what else do we know about um, those three names you mentioned? Asaph, Jeduthun, and Heman. Oh, we have some psalms from Asaph. Every one of them has written at least one song. As we know, the Levites were the ones responsible for the temple services. Among them were some who were paid to be professional musicians. In the days of David, what do we know about that, Dennis? This is from the Adult Sabbath School uh, Study Guide for December 1st. A full-fledged music academy was organized, which... He, that being David, supervised. It had teachers and students, young and old, who worked in shifts in the temple providing music. Some were instrumentalists, others singers, yet others took care of the instruments and the garments used for the services. What was the purpose of such a professional organization? It served to develop talent and the vision of excellence in worship. And so now I'm going to raise some questions. Where do these guys play? Obviously, it wasn't in the holy, most holy place. It wasn't in the holy place. They must have been playing outside in the courtyard. Did they provide continuous music for the worshipers? I don't know. So what kind of music, either singing or instrumental, seems most appropriate in your mind for worshiping God? My family and I have traveled back and forth between Africa and Loma Linda several times during our 17 years of work in Africa. What an incredible difference in style of music between those two settings. But in both cases it was given in praise to the Lord. Do you think God accepted both of those types of music? The heart was right. Yeah. Well, I didn't have a way of checking that. <laughs> well, the Lord looks on the heart. Yes. We look on the outward appearances. Yes. So does he accept the uh, Christian rock music of today? I was hoping you wouldn't mention that. <laughs> I don't know. How about, if I may ask, how about, trauma, how about drums? Were drums ever used in uh, Jewish worship? In the Bible. No, Jewish worship? On Jewish worship. Or did I was, I was told by someone that they used drums only to welcome the warriors coming back from a triumphant really? war? Yes. Other than that, they never used it in their worship. Now, I don't read anywhere well, in the... Here's, here's the thing. In answer, I mean, that's a good question. As far as what we read about the actual services, 
There was no mention of music at all. So this is added on at some point. Now we don't know whether this started in the days of David or whatever, but if you go back to Leviticus or Numbers or wherever, Exodus, where they were doing this initially, as far as I know, there's no mention of music being used anywhere. Except in Psalms. Well, yeah, but now that's not directly connected with the... the, I mean, yeah, we believe they were used, but as I say, if you go back and, and read, okay... What happens in the high, on the Day of Atonement, or what happens somewhere right. at those times, those occasions? I'm not aware that any music is mentioned. But even in Psalms, I I've never read drums there. Yes, there is drums in, in, in the worship in Psalms. Yeah, there's there's one or two places where it's mentioned in the Psalms. It doesn't say about doesn't specifically mention in worship, but it mentions that they they were in celebration. Well. There are numerous occasions in the Bible when music was a part of worship. Several of the most important are found in Exodus 51, 1, what oca- 15, 1, I'm sorry. When was that? What was that occasion? Crossing in the Red Sea. Well, not just the crossing. They got this side and the enemies right, were drowned. Afterwards. And now it was time to celebrate. And it was led by? Miriam. 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 Miriam, exactly. What about Second Chronicles 20? In fact, there's just a couple of verses there. Let me read those. Well, first of all, what was the context of Second Chronicles 20? Three nations had put all their military groups together, big armies, and they decided they were going to conquer Jehoshaphat and the Jews, the Jewish people in the southern kingdom. And they were all massed on there, ready, ready to attack. And Joshua said, there's no way I can deal with all this. So he went to the, went to the Lord in the temple and said, what should I do? And one of the people came back to him and said, well, the Lord has given me a message. Put the temple singers and the musicians out in front of the army. And so they marched out there to attack their enemies and the singers and the, and the priests out there in front. And as soon as... They, well, let me read what it says. After consulting with the people, the king ordered some musicians to put on the robes they wore on sacred occasions and to march ahead of the army singing, Praise the Lord, His love is eternal. When they began to sing, the Lord threw the invading armies into a panic. The Ammonites and the Moabites and the Edomites and so forth. Sounds a little bit like what uh, Samuel's sons hoped would happen when they yes, wouldn't took that the, have the Ark of the Covenant yeah. into battle. Well, there's another occasion when there's some celebration, and that's found in Revelation 15. What happens there? See a glass. Okay, not just that. What what was happening on the Sea of Glass? <clears throat> 144,000. Yeah, that's in Revelation 14. Is it the Song of Moses and the Lamb? Victorious no. group or no. celebrate? Yes, 15 what? is Song of Moses. Song okay, of, but read the first the read the first verse. What does it say? Lord God seven. Almighty. Are you talking about the that Revelation song or, or, or Revelation 15? Revelation 15. Then I saw in the sky another mysterious sight, great and amazing. There were seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last ones, because okay. they are the final expression of God's anger. Okay, is that a reason for praising and praising God? Wouldn't seem like it. <laughs> That's well, the question. Well, back in, what is it, seven were the souls under the altar... Five, uh, six actually. Yeah, are crying out for justice, and they're told to wait a little longer. So that doesn't when it, sound like a reason to celebrate either. Wait, for, well, wait, some more people are going to get killed. Now let's celebrate. Well, I don't think that, so. For God to, to uh, well, let's look at that. What what are they asking for? Well, they're, they're, they're asking, God, why, why are you waiting? What, why don't you do something? And what does God say? He says, wait, there's more people to be killed. That's what he says. So, well, he uses more euphemistic by, language. <laughs> euphemistic <laughs> language. By, by being killed, you're talking about... More martyrs. Martyrs, more yeah. martyrs, not the... Uh, yeah, no, it's more martyrs are coming. Okay, well... But the thing about that is, let's let's be clear. I don't want to make it sound like it's completely crazy. John is shown the people standing on the sea of glass and celebrating before he goes on to explain about the seven last plagues to say 
this isn't a total disaster for everybody. There are going to be a group who are going to stand through all of this and they will stand on the sea of glass before God's throne and they will be singing. So what happens between the beginning of Revelation 15 and the end of 16 is important, but he's giving you a view ahead of what their final results are going to be standing on the sea of glass before he talks about the awful things that are going to happen in chapter 16. So I think that's the explanation of what we're saying. saying there's hope, this is the end. Yeah. And now we'll go back and discuss the horrible things that happened. Yeah. Well, Christians have struggled down to the generation to find the right balance between reverence and joy in worship services. Given what we know about the great controversy, shouldn't a recognition of the truth about God lead to rapturous joy and eternal worship? How do you respond? of mouth speak it so if he's in our heart and we're thankful for what he's done mm-hmm. as we'll see I think in Revelation well, 5 and 6 where you see uh, yeah I would say recognizing what God has done in the great controversy in this incredible battle against Satan we ought to rejoice every day perhaps our our personal worship should be more vibrant Yes. than corporate worship. Well, here's the thing that I would like to suggest. Most of our Christian friends think that the reason they're celebrating in worship is because of their personal salvation. Seventh-day Adventists have a great controversy view. We should be singing and praising God for who He is and how we can worship Him and how we can praise Him for how He is corrected all the problems in the universe so when we go home it'll be safe to live there. Amen. Amen. I, I think that's a greater reason to celebrate. Yes. Well, the music preferences have been one of the most contentious issues in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and not just in our church. In general, those who've been Christians for a longer period of time, we're speaking those in nice terms, tend to prefer the traditional home, hymns. Are you referring to us old people? But, but you didn't have to mention that. <laughs> Well, young that's people what you implied. <laughs> <laughs> young people on the other hand prefer a more lively music style is it possible to please the different age groups in church with different kinds of music or do we have to agree on the same kind of music that would be very difficult do we appreciate our musicians as we should when you leave the church each Sabbath do you feel fulfilled rewarded blessed is part of that blessing a result of the music that has been presented? I yes. hope so. Yes. Well, those who participated in the temple services were expected to be clean and pure. The cleansing ceremonies were somewhat ritualistic in nature, but it involved real cleaning. So, our pastors do not go through an elaborate ritualistic cleansing before speaking at our services. Have we lost something in, the wor- in our worship of God? How are we supposed to be purified in our day? Gordon? From 1 John 1, 7 through 9. But if we live in the light, just as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from every sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and there is no truth in us. But if we confess our sins to God... He will keep his promise and do what is right. He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our wrongdoing. So we have two purifications mentioned there and we're being purified from what? Sin. Sin and wrongdoing. So that's what we're trying to get rid of before we enter our worship services, right? One of the fairly time-consuming parts of the worship services in the temple involved purification and the taking of ritualistic baths. Well, that would take a while. What is a ritual bath? Well, look at a couple of verses. Exodus 24, 9. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of my presence and tell them to take a ritual bath. Now, you think that they stripped down right there in front of the entire congregation and took a regular bath? No. Uh, But it was a ritual bath. Their lives would be cleansed and purified. All of those ceremonies were to impress upon the minds of the people that their sins were gone forever, either into the wilderness with the scapegoat 
or b burned with the remains of the other sacrifices. So it was a picturesque way of saying God is going to take care of your sins. He's going to burn them or he's going to eliminate them, right? Charles, there's something more there. Numbers 19, 5 through 7. The whole animal, including the skin, the meat, blood, and the intestines, is to be burnt in the presence of the priest. Then he is to take some cedar wood, a spring of hyssop, um, and a red, red cord, and throw them in the, into the fire. After that, he is to wash his clothes and pour water over himself. And then he may enter the camp, but he remains ritually unclean until the evening. So what do you think all that means? Well, I had a Jewish colleague who showed part of the ritual cleaning that the Jews do. Okay. And it wasn't to wash his hands. It was a ceremony. Mm -hmm. Just a ceremony. Now, when we say that, we, not, we must remember that Jesus, the time he made the, turned the water into wine at the wedding of Cana, those huge things that help... Say some people have estimated they have held, they held up to 33 gallons of water, and there were several of them. Those were containers for ritualistic cleanings. So it, I don't know. I'm just that's all the information I have. Well, the most serious purification ritual involved those who had come in contact with a dead body. Now, would the reason for being for cleansing yourself after coming in contact with a dead body? Absolutely. We, we, we see health reasons for doing that, right? Yes. Well, see that described in detail in Numbers 19. You can read about it. If one refused to go through the regular purification that was supposed to take place after one had contacted a dead body, he was considered to be unclean. And what happened? They'd no longer be considered one of God's people. Numbers nineteen thirteen. You might think that's oh. yours. Whoever touches a corpse and does not purify himself remains unclean, because the water for for purification has not been thrown over him. He defiles the Lord, the Lord's tent, and he will no longer be considered one of God's people. A good news Bible. Okay, now I'm going to raise another question. Every time the priest slew a lamb. Or the people slew a lamb and the priest, the, the priest dealt with it, they were dealing with a dead body. But dead bodies of animals don't make you impure, but dead bodies of people do? Well, <clears throat> wasn't, uh, if you found an animal that you didn't know how it was died, it had died, that would be different, I think. Yeah. But I think, uh, like those who took care of the sheep in Jesus' day, and weren't they considered unclean for because of their association and time with the animals? Well, I what I do know is that the tanner that Peter stayed with down right. in Joppa, I mean, he was dealing with dead animals twenty well, I was like twenty four seven, but he, all all his working life every day. Yeah. Well, on the Day of Atonement. The high priest went through multiple cleansing ceremonies. How much were the people involved in observing or participating in any of those cleansing ceremonies? Jim? Le Leviticus 16, 4 and 23 and 24. When the Lord gave the following instructions, before Aaron goes into the most holy place, he must have a bath and put on the priestly garments, the linen robe, and shorts, the belt, and the turban. Then Aaron shall go into the tent, take off the priestly garments that he had put on before entering the most holy place, and leave them there. He must bathe in the holy place and put on his own clothes. After that, he shall go out and offer the burnt offering to remove his own sins and those of the people. Good news, Bible. So, during the Day of Atonement, there was a lot of bathing going on at least for the high priest. It was quite a process. Well, should we uh, 
Do we need to? There are people among us who feel like we should return to doing all the ceremonies that were hap- that were happening back in Old Testament times. So, do we need to establish some kind of ritual in- ritual cleansing in connection with our church services? Well, it would be good for us to remember when we come in to the sanctuary to that so we're entering a place. You, we can remember that our Muslim friends, that's what they do. They go there and they cleanse. I mean, they have to go through that process every time they go to church before they go in and enter the, the mosque. Sometimes we, they do it. Uh, some guy heard at a Burger King, I guess, he was washing his feet t- five times a day in the sink at the, at the Burger King. Oh, really? So. Well, he worked there or something, huh? We had a uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox priest uh, who was who visited our church. I think he was taking treatment for cancer or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, the person brought him in there, and he went into a panic looking for a cross because he has he has to go through a ritual mm-hmm. uh, before he enters into the sanctuary. So. Uh, I guess he missed the one that's on the steeple outside. But, yeah. Uh, but the, those things, uh, you know, there needs to be something. Of course, when we come in, we shake hands and greet people, and we get into kind of a social uh, mood uh, as we're going in. Um, on the other hand, if we didn't have that, uh, visitors might feel strange, you know, if they're mm-hmm. coming in and everybody was just quiet and didn't say anything, didn't acknowledge anything uh, back and forth, uh, that might uh, well, make not, not fe- make them feel welcome. Yeah. So. Here's the question. When we come to church, are we dirty? Not as a rule. Well, <laughs> Jesus, a rule. <laughs> Jesus said that if you bring your gift to the altar and you have, you know, your brother has something against you, you should go and be reconciled to your brother first, yep. and then come and offer your gifts. So uh, there may be something in that that we, when we come, we need to uh, yeah. make sure that all our wrongs are, are so dealt with. So should we pre- have to? Well, well should we? Not have to, but should we prepare ourselves in some way before we come to church on Sabbath mornings? Absolutely. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. I think that what Jackie said is the point. Every day. Mm-hmm. Not just every day, all the time. Yeah, Part of the I was reading in uh, conjunction, we, I don't know if we'll talk about David dancing before the Lord, but uh, that was on the second approach to Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. The first approach, you had Uzzah who touched the ark. And he, it was on a cart. It was supposed to be carried, so they weren't. There was lack, lackness all around. But he was. Uh, I don't know the expression, but he was. He was had sin in his life, and so it made him uh, a little lax when it came to the instructions and purposes of God. And so that's in presumption he steadied the ark, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you can read about it in yeah. prophets and, or patriarchs and prophets. Okay, so let me let, let's just press along here. Let's be honest. I mean, and, and I'm not trying to be difficult. Could you worship God worshipfully while you're watching people kill animals? I think, it, from my perspective, that would be hard. If you've been in a killing factory. Uh, any way you look at it, it's not good. And that's basically what they had there. Yeah. Is this the sacrifice you're talking about? Uh, Mm -hmm. Well, if a kid did something wrong and he had only one lamb and he had to sacrifice that lamb, he would think twice before who would do that again. So in that case, yes, uh, it would probably, I'm sure it tore up the hearts of many people saying, it's my sin. Mm-hmm. That's caused the death of this when poor little lamb. My mother grew up on a farm, and she had one of the baby goats became her special pet, and she loved that little goat. Unfortunately, one day, a friend visited their place with a friend. This was back in the 1920s, with a brand new car with a canvas roof, and this goat went jumping onto the top of the car 
and on top of the roof and his hooves came right down through the canvas roof and that was kind of the end of that uh, goat <laughs> but it hurt your mom yeah so, she was very, very sorry to see that boat that goat god but very quickly i want to go back to your question about sabbath preparations mm -hmm. some point fondest memory in adventist school systems is friday afternoon mm -hmm. you know there's something different is coming in that entire campus yeah. that was beautiful well, how would you feel if you had to kill an animal every time to receive forgiveness for your sins Get sick of it. Get sick of it now. Yeah. What is, would we get sick of? The killing or the sin? What I'm getting at is this. If you go in where they do this to sheep and cattle all the time, most of them are fairly quiet. Pigs, no. I've heard pigs squeal long before anybody got to them. It's, it's not a nice scene. Not at all. Remember that the sacrifices were to remind people that sin leads to death. So what do we have to remind us that sin leads to death? We could raise a lot of questions about why it was necessary to kill innocent animals to somehow deal with the sins of human beings. If we had time, we would read all of Hebrews 9, 1 to 11. Paul himself made it clear that the sacrifice of animals could never make a worshiper's heart perfect. This is the Pharisee speaking. Okay? These outward rules and ceremonies were only a temporary measure until the true sacrifice was made on Calvary's cross. One of the main reasons for celebrating in Christian services has often been the idea that Christ on the cross has borne our punishment for our sins. What is that punishment? Many of our Christian friends think that God the Father is just waiting to punish sinners. But in their mind, He does not because Christ is there standing before him, pleading his blood, and that assuages God's wrath. Is that a correct biblical teaching? No. No. Well, it starts off with the, the wrong idea, and yeah. anything that proceeds after that uh, could be just, you know, in some sense could be true, but it's distorted because yeah. of the foundation. Because okay, God well, is not trying to punish sinners he's he's trying, trying to, to he's trying to save them so jesus's efforts are are uh, to save us he's yeah. uh, he sent uh, his only son to to save us so. that was god's plan the father's plan he right. sent his son to save us well look at romans 6:23 sin pays its wage death but god's free gift is eternal life in union with christ jesus our lord Sin has its own punishment, death. God's free gift is not punishment, but eternal life. God does not need to add any punishment to make the results of sin worse. They are bad enough already. We believe that God is forgiveness personified. God forgave even those who are nailing him to the cross. We have Luke twenty three thirty four. Jesus said, Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they are doing. Was he godlike when he said that? He was God. He was God. If God the Son could forgive those who are nailing him to the cross, he can and does forgive everyone. Amen. And please note very clearly that none of them were asking for forgiveness. They're pounding nails in somebody's arms. And being forgiven certainly did not guarantee their salvation. That's another mistake. In, that, in the special resurrection that you can read about in, in the book of Re in Revelation, just before Christ's second coming, Ellen White has these words to say about those people. Carrie? The men who smote and spit upon the Prince of Life now turn from his piercing gaze and seek to flee from the overpowering glory of his presence. Those who drove the nails through his hands and feet the soldier who pierced his side, behold these marks with terror and remorse. It comes from the Great Controversy, page 643, paragraph 2. So, reading that, does it sound like these people are going to be saved? No. Oh, I don't think so. So, forgiving them doesn't make them savable. Though, contrary to what many teach about justification... There were many details that went into worshiping of God in the temple in ancient times. Unfortunately, 
There were times when the temple was thought to be an end in itself. But that was never God's intention. It was God's intention that all the ceremonies would serve to bring people's minds back to a true appreciation and worship of our almighty and wonderful God. So, to worship in our day, people go to an auditorium where they sit down mostly and listen while someone read, provides music from the front or they stand and sing together. In the ancient temple, there were no auditoriums. As the musicians sang and played their instruments, the people bowed in prayer. That was how they worshiped God. Have we lost something? In uh, Desire of Ages, uh, chapter 51, The Light of Light, light of life um, Jesus then then spake Jesus again unto them saying I am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life uh, so he was in the court of the temple specially connected with the services of the feast of tabernacles um, in the center of the court there rose two lofty standards supporting lampstands of great size at the evening sacrifice after the evening sacrifice, all the lamps were kindled. So mm -hmm. uh, what follows is after the sacrifice. After 3 p.m. Not, af not during the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, the lamps were kindled, shedding their light over Jerusalem. This ceremony was in commem commemoration of the pillar of light that guided Israel in the desert. Was also regarded as pointing to the coming of the Messiah. That evening, when the lights were lighted, the court was a scene of great rejoicing. Gray-haired gray men, the priests of the temple, and the rulers of the people, united in the festival dances to the sound of instrumental music and the chants of the Levites. Okay. The Desire of Ages, four sixty-three point two. Considering all that God has done for us, especially through the life and death of Jesus. Don't we have sufficient reason for celebration and worship? Man, I think so. We have the truth established by the life and death of Jesus himself and ultimately by his sacrifice on the cross. And again, see John 1, 26 and 39, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. But look especially at Revelation 5, 6 and 12 to 13. Jackie? Then I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne, surrounded by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb appeared to have been killed. The Greek word means brutally slaughtered. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God that have been sent throughout the whole earth, and sang in a loud voice, The lamb who was killed is worthy to receive power wealth, wisdom and strength and I wish I could know the mm. tune so I could sing it yeah. honor, glory and praise and I heard every creature in heaven, on earth in the world below and in the sea, all living beings in the universe and they were singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures answered, Amen! And the elders fell down and worshipped. Okay, so who in, the, who in the universe is not worshipping? Nobody. This everybody. is everybody, including the fish and everything that has breath. Well, let me just read you two more verses, the ones from Philippians 2. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord mm -hmm. to the glory of God the Father. And who does that include? Satan himself. He Satan will, himself. He will briefly admit that he was wrong and then say, wait a minute, I can't do that. Yeah. It is interesting to notice here in Revelation that every creature in heaven, on earth, in the world below, and in the sea, all living beings in the universe were singing, quote, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor, glory and might forever and ever. These verses need to be compared with Philippians 2, 10, 11, which I just read to you. One day, will even Satan be singing praise and honor, glory and might be, ever, be forever and ever to God? Not with his heart. 
Maybe no. with his lips. Okay. I think he'll realize he made a mistake. And he will confess before he's destroyed. What, what can he possibly think every time he reads or hears these words? Day is coming. I messed up. It makes him madder and hops, I'm sure. I, I think he just hates God more. Mm -hmm. Well, do we rejoice after we pray and ask God to forgive our sins? Do we always approach God with reverence as well as rejoicing? Dennis? Psalms 95, 1 and 6. Come, let us praise the Lord. Let us sing for joy to God who protects us. Come, let us bow down and worship him. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Well, can you name some of the things that God has done for you that are good reasons to sing praises to him? Man, a whole list Nanny. of them every day, right? Nanny. What stories in the Bible can you think of that would have caused you to want to sing and praise God? Do you think Daniel and his three friends were ready to praise God after Daniel spoke to Nebuchadnezzar and explained to him his dream? And you don't get your necks cut off? Later, did they rejoice after they were taken out of the fiery furnace? I think that would be adequate reason for rejoicing. Both of those and more. And more. Are we awed, filled with awe, by the idea that God, who created everything in our universe, chose to become a human being and die on our behalf? Yes. Well, look at Nehemiah 12, 44 to 47. At that time, men were put in charge of the storerooms where contributions for the temple were kept, including the tithes and the first corn and root fruit that ripened each year. These men were responsible for collecting from the farms near the various cities the contributions for the priests and the Levites, which the law required. All the people of Judah were pleased with the priests and the Levites because they performed the ceremonies of purification and other rituals that God had commanded. The temple musicians and the temple guards also performed their duties in accordance with the regulations made by King David and his son Solomon. From the time of King David and the musician Asaph long ago, the musicians have led songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In the time of Zerubbabel, um, and also in the time of Nehemiah, all the people of Israel gave daily gifts for the support of the temple musicians and the temple guards. The people gave a sacred offering to the Levites, and the Levites gave their required portion to the priests. Wow. Notice that all the people were pleased with the priests and Levites. Those priests and Levites were carefully performing the ceremonies consisting of the purifications and other rituals that God had originally commanded. Were they rejoicing because in the past... They were aware of all the times when the priests and Levites did not do what they were supposed to and thus did not represent God correctly? You mean like in the times of Samuel's sons? Or what about the Levite and his concubine in Judges 19? That one too. So now we have seen that beginning with the reading of God's word to the people in a language they could understand they prayed and worshipped and rededicated themselves to God in a marvelous series of worshipful events. Think about what the cross of Christ has meant to you. Do you understand all the implications of Christ's death on the cross? We need to remember that his death on the cross was for the benefit not only of human beings, but also for the entire universe. Do we understand what that means? From Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 486, Ellen White wrote, The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. Can I, can I interrupt for a second? There are many people who believe that when we get to heaven, all trace of sin will be eliminated. All Bibles will be burned. All Bibles will be burned. Is that what that means? No. <laughs> How can we discuss the plan of salvation if all record of sin is eliminated? Or will this the, the record be there but the names will be blotted out? So we don't know who did it? Well, in Isaiah it says they will go and look on the uh, corpses of those who... Uh, yeah. But that's only the wicked. Of the wicked, yeah. So. Yeah. Huh. Ne well, read on. 
but, the sins but of, the of course, righteous. Jesus will have scars that yes. will remind us of and what And you know did. that famous photograph, that uh, not photograph, that famous painting by um, Harry, Anderson. Harry Anderson. The little girl says, what happened to your hands? And Jesus is going to say, well, I'm not sure. How do they? <laughs> What's he going to say? There, there, you, if you're going to explain the, the plan of salvation, you have to mention sin. There's no way to avoid mentioning sin. One so, thing we know that we're not going to be bored to death in heaven. That we will not be we, bored to death. No, we're not going to be. And it's Absolutely. going to be exciting. Okay, Gordon, we need to keep moving. Continuing from Spirit of Prophecy. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld the unnumbered worlds through the vast realms of space, the beloved of God, the majesty of heaven, he whom cherub and shining seraph delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift uh, fallen man, that he bore the guilt and the shame of sin and the hiding of his father's face till the woes of a lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross. That the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. Wow. As the nations of the saved look upon their Savior and behold the eternal glory of the Father shining in his countenance as they behold his throne, which is from everlasting to everlasting, and know that his kingdom is to have no end, they break forth in a rapturous song. Wow. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us to God for his own most precious blood. So what is Christ doing right now for the benefit of the onlooking universe? Charles, I think you have a few words straight from the Bible on that. Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, 8 through 10. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. All creation together. Okay, read on. Ephesians 3, 9 through 10. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that he, that at the present time, by means of all church, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. So the church is here to educate the universe about God, right? Amen. Amen. Yes. yes. Colossians 1, 19, 20, For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the world, whole world, whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. So we must never make the mistake of limiting, limiting the plan of salvation of this one little world. God has to resolve the issues in the great controversy that started in heaven, not here on this earth, started in heaven when Satan rebelled, Lucifer rebelled and became Satan, those issues have to be resolved for this, to the satisfaction of everybody in the entire universe. Then he can bring it all to a conclusion. So what should we conclude from the reading of these experiences during the days of Ezra and Nehemiah? First of all, we should recognize, as hopefully they did, that physical walls are not what saves us. Our only ultimate protection is the Lord. And you know that from Psalm 127. What is supposed to be the role of joy in the act of worship? Certainly there are reasons to rejoice because of what God has done for us. But is joy nothing more than an emotional high? Is that different from a spiritual high? Do you go to church on a regular basis to experience an emotional or spiritual high? Well, the second 
uh, gift of the spirit is joy, mm-hmm. love, joy, peace. So there, there's always counterfeits of love, joy, and peace. So there has to be a, a true joy, joy that comes from knowing Him, and uh, along with the peace and the love that. Um, that we, we can come to know God as it is our privilege to know Him. Let me summarize what I think you just said with a couple words. Sabbath is the best day of the week. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen. Amen. And joy, to me, is not subjective. It's constant. Yeah. Well, what is supposed to be the role of joy in the act of worship? Certainly there are reasons to rejoice because of what, what God has done for us, but, but is joy nothing more than we read that? Spiritual high or emotional high? Unfortunately, even in ancient times, people often failed to bring their tithes, so those who were supposed to be serving the people who came to the temple had to go back to planting their own gardens and supporting themselves. In our day, of course, that same could be true. So how are we? We are supposed to carry gospel to the whole world. So who's going to support the people who have to go out to places where there's no church, where there's no work going on? That's what the tithing system is supposed to do. That's what supports our pastors. And it's it's really, I mean, if we come to church and experience the blessings of the coming to church and aren't willing to support it with our tithes, that's a travesty. That's just wrong. We are very fortunate to have as a church system, the tithing system, which we have had from the beginning of really of, of our church service, and we can trace it. We've already done. We tra- we can trace that way back to the days of Abraham, and Melchizedek, and Job. That tithing system is really important. So, as we think about the reasons for rejoicing in this lesson, one of those reasons for rejoicing is that we have a system that properly supports the musicians and the pastors and the carrying the gospel to the entire world. A kind and wonderful Father, what more can we say after a wonderful lesson about celebrating you, celebrating what you've done, worshiping you? May we learn to do it more correctly and more honestly and more joyfully than ever before is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.